Hi, everybody. You are at Jim B. Live. That's the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education. And this is approximately monthly webinar series for um, all members of the public to come and learn about recent research published in Jim B. My name is Rachel Horak. I'm an education specialist at the American Society for Microbiology. And today we have two fantastic speakers who are going to talk to you about their recently published paper. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, ASM uh, and Jim B. Life for inviting me and my colleague Sarah here today to discuss the findings from our pandemic pivot entitled Impacts of a COVID-19 e-service learning module in a non-majors biology course. My name is Samiksha Raut. I am an associate professor of biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And accompanying me today is Dr. Sarah Atkins Jablonski, who is at the Alabama College of Osteopathic Medicine pursuing her MD now. And she pursued this project as the primary lead on it when she was a graduate student in our department of biology, working at the interface of arts, biology, microbiology, and also education, a very unique combination of, of her PhD. And I, at the outset, I also wanted to acknowledge our research team from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, beginning with Dr. Jeff Morris, who is a microbiologist by training and a longstanding companion and a collaborator on many different projects with us. Our incredibly hardworking undergraduate students, Riley Fleming and Diana Busio. Diana has now graduated and moved on to medical school. And last but not the least, it is my pleasure to introduce a rising star in the world of biology education, our summer intern uh, since the last two years uh, from Doherty Valley High School, San Ramon, California, Marco Esteban, who is a co-author not only on this paper, but two other upcoming papers. So before I dive into the details of our project, I would like to start off with acknowledging how much of a revolution has taken place in an undergraduate classroom with the implementation of vision and change. Most of us are aware that sweeping changes and other types of curricular reforms have been introduced since we have learned about vision and change, beginning with active learning in the classroom, change of the modular pattern of the classroom to course-based undergraduate research. Indeed, many findings over the last decade easily indicate that active learning and course-based undergraduate research, and many of these evidence-based reforms are helping us to close the equity gaps and making education as inclusive as possible for almost all demographic groups. While this has been pursued, a lot of this focus has been exclusively restricted to our STEM majors, leaving very few of any reforms just to be adapted from this, from this sweeping change onto what are non-majors or what we call as general biology majors, also known as non-STEM majors or general education majors, as some authors love, like to describe them. So there is no mandate on like what exactly we should be teaching these students, what are some of the core competencies we need to develop for these students, and as a result of that, the curriculum is quite varied across different institutions in the United States. And this is easily evident if you were to open up any textbook related to non-majors that has been published by a wide variety of different publishers. So who are these non-majors and why should we really worry about the curriculum that we are instructing to these students in our classroom? Well, the non-majors biology students are those students who have to rely on completing just one or two science courses as their prerequisites to complete a college degree. These students usually come from fields like psychology, public health, marketing majors to education majors to foreign science languages majors and many more others. So as you can see, they're simply relying on one or two science courses. And I wanna pause on that because they are going to develop their scientific thought process to be a part of many different segments of our society, becoming tomorrow's voters, consumers, policy makers, and also populations of the general public or workers. And it is incredibly important that we pay attention to what we are teaching these students in these 
one or two science classes as we instruct them and we should really take a deep dive into the curriculum. So I also started teaching non-majors since a while now, I have to say, and I encountered a lot of different barriers. And I'm pretty sure the audience today is also intri intrigued with like, who are these non-majors? And maybe if you are teaching these non-majors, I would love for you to describe what are some of the barriers you have encountered in your experiences or envision them if you have never taught these non-majors or general education majors. So I would pause for a minute and I would love to uh, have you share your thoughts in the chat as to what barriers you have encountered teaching these non-STEM majors or general education majors. See, many have fear of science and math courses, no motivation for science. Students are intimidated, lack of basic science terminology. Absolutely, I would echo many of these things that are coming in in the chat and I also felt the exact same thing when I was teaching these non-majors. And in fact, research that has very little bit of research that has been devoted to the non-majors have also shown that they lack a sense of motivation. They lack, they have gaps in their scientific knowledge. And also they do not feel motivated in, in a science classroom. So the ultimate responsibility as an educator upon us is how do we get them excited about science? How do we make science relatable as it happens in day-to-day -day life. And that's exactly was the question before me when I first started to instruct these non-majors at University of Alabama at Birmingham. So I wanted to orient everybody to UAB. UAB is located in the heart of Birmingham, which is nestled uh, in the civil rights movement. And also we have a huge uh, underrepresented student population on this campus. UAB is very well known for its medical school, dental school, and also we have a huge non-majors student population in the Department of Biology, where we teach a course which is titled Contemporary Topics of Biology. And since the last five years, we have implemented service learning. So it's rightfully designated as service learning. The course usually is taught twice a week. Um, yeah, for a 75 minute time period. And also on an average, this course is divided into an online section and an in-class section and together it involves somewhere between 400 to 500 students each incoming semester, including the summer semester. And so why service learning and why did I start thinking about the curricular reforms? Just like many other instructors, I was constantly facing a hurdle of like students not feeling motivated about the content and me going exactly by the, by the book, book way, like resorting on a book and then teaching this course. And it clearly didn't work out. Then I had to change uh, a few things and I adapted what's known as a theme-based modular approach. I start off this course with what is known as Scientific, um, scientific literacy module in which we talk about credible and non-credible sources. We learn, help the students identify the differences between them followed by fundamentals of biology, uh, genetics, and then we top it off with other types of modules as they tie to day-to-day -to -day life or uh, societal topics like evolution, like why should we care about evolution to climate change, to opioid addiction, and also to COVID-19 of course. It is, it is uh, there is active learning that is implemented. The course is also supported with peer leaders. And we have been, as I mentioned earlier, we have been using a high impact practice like service learning. So what in the world is service learning? If you've never heard about service learning, service learning is a form of experiential education. And as you can see from the first panel diagram over there, course content is tied with meaningful service. And this, both these course content and meaningful service is then reflected upon by students because you wanna know what the students are learning. So you could have frequent reflections, weekly reflections, or also you could have reflections towards the start of the semester or the end of the semester, whichever way you want. And you can see from the other panel diagram that the instructor is definitely benefiting in relaying the information as the uh, learning objectives are tied with the meaningful service, the students are benefiting, and also indeed the community partner is benefiting here. So this is the classic model of service learning, also known as experiential education. 
as per the definition of Eiler and Giles in 1999. In fact, I am, uh, I am pleased to inform you that service learning, although sounds very new right now, was first implemented in the late 18th century uh, by Harvard University first. There are some distinct advantages or benefits to service learning. Implementing service learning results in students accomplishing higher learning gains of the content. Of course, they have to be tied with, with a community partner. It fosters student engagement at multiple levels, cognitive, behavioral, emotional, and social. And it also increases awareness of social issues, science values, civic skills, as we have displayed in our, in our findings from this study and also from our previously published study in 2020. Above all, it also enhances retention rates in biology and other disciplines. And so it sounds like service learning is a very key tool, pedagogical active learning tool that we, one can utilize in the classroom um, to help drive home some important points. Indeed, our last published study uh, has shown that service learning curriculum enhances climate change awareness. You can read more about this paper in Sensor. Uh, that was published by Mendoza et al. in 2020. And so coming to the core of our present study that we wanna highlight today is describing the importance of service learning in the light of an active pandemic. So last spring 2020, I was uh, the instructor of record for this course. And we had, we had already an inbuilt service learning module that was on opioid addiction, which is not described in the paper or which will also not be described today, but we have a paper in preparation right now where we are trying to uh, write that up. As regards this COVID-19 module, if you pause for a moment and think all the way back to March, what was happening towards the beginning of March was a steady climb in COVID-19 cases. There was a mass, mass decree that was getting introduced. Social distancing guidelines were getting implemented everywhere across the corner. And then finally, middle of March, the World Health Organization declared that we were indeed in a pandemic, a term that most of us, if you have been teaching microbiology, you may have loosely described. Now you know how it is to live in a pandemic. Well, there were a lot of, lot of resistance towards social distancing, towards wearing masks, and we felt that educating our non-majors at that point in time was indeed quite important. Also, if you look at the general public, which are non-majors make up a part of that, majority of them get their information about scientific math matters from the social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and any other of these non-credible, so-called non-credible sources, which some of them have great difficulty understanding the differences between the two. And so we felt that we really wanted to implement a fast and furious module that was implemented mid of March and then culminated by the end of April. So this course was meeting in person twice a week and then it moved to a remote mode of instruction. And so we implemented service learning for the COVID-19 module because we also found that there was, we were fighting an infodemic in a pandemic. Lots and lots of irrelevant information was traveling through the social media. So what is it, what was so unique about this module was that we had four virtual interactive guest lectures. Two of these guest lectures were given by public health experts at UAB who talked about healthcare inequities and other types of statistical numbers. And the students had a chance to ask all kinds of questions to them. Then if you think about like March, there was shortages of not only masks, but most importantly, ventilators. So we felt it was very important to bring in a pulmonologist who was working in an emergency department treating COVID-19 patients to talk about what, it, what do the ventilators do and why COVID-19 is affecting the lungs and why should we be careful about this respiratory virus that is wear a mask and also exercise other measures. And last but not the least, we also invited a patient who had just recovered from COVID-19 to give their verdict of what it was to go through this disease and the symptoms that they had experienced. After that, the students were divided in groups. They were divided in groups according to their class level and according um, to their majors as well, which was very important uh, since we have been doing this quite for quite a while. And they were asked to make an infographic poster we also had a short module on how to make the infographic posters. And we also recruited 
nearly 20 peer leaders, upperclassmen from uh, biology classes to serve as peer leaders for this course. And every group, so we had 24 groups, 20 to 24 groups, and every group was led by a peer leader who was kind of shepherding what the students were doing and also cross-checking if they were presenting relevant information in, on their infographics posters. So here on the screen, you can see two displayed infographics posters. And then we also have an Instagram page for the class. We asked the students, so instead of a community partner, what we asked the students to do this time was display these infographics posters on our Instagram page, of course, with consent, and then also ask them to distribute these infographics posters on, on their church websites or on their social media platforms and other places wherever they could. Uh, we are also pleased to inform you that our university helped us helped us propagate what we were doing in this classroom through the infographics posters by actually covering a press release on what we were doing in this class, which also helped us to magnify our efforts on social media and get the message out there about, uh, about COVID-19 safety measures. Towards the end of the module, the students completed a post-reflection essay. So this was the prompt for the students to complete. We were not really looking at right or wrong answers, but we really wanted to ascertain the learning gains. What is it that you have learned from this module that you would like us to inform? And, um, and we collected all the responses on our Canvas platform. And after that, we began to analyze the data. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, who will be navigating the other half of the talk. Thank you so much. So we have, almost 100 students in, or over 100 students in this class. Um, and they've completed these post-reflection surveys at the end of the module. And so now we have these reflections and we wanna know what, what, do we do, what do we do with them? How do we actually figure out what students got from this like really, really time intensive module that was, I mean, there's a lot of effort that went into it, right? There's lots of peer leaders, there's lots of guest lectures. And we wanna know, was it effective? And what were students saying? at the outcome of this class. So our question was, which parts of our module did students reflect on during that post-reflection topic um, that Dr. Rapp just described? So we have um, over hundred student essays. And if you go to the next slide, uh, it maps out. Can you click the next slide? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, we have 112 students in the class who completed it because it was part of their grade and 87 of them consented um, after we got IRB approval for us to use their post-reflections in this study. And at the end of the semester, we also tried to recruit students to consent to one-on-one um, -on -one interviews. So this was done through Zoom. It was sort of difficult because at that time, as Dr. Rout noted, um, the university had already switched to online. So we're trying to email as many students as possible to try to recruit them to do interviews. And thankfully, um, eight students participated in that. But that was, I guess, something to learn going forward is uh, how to recruit students for interviews um, in, in the online educational landscape. But okay, so we have 87 post-reflections and we've interviewed eight students and the interview script was basically their post-reflection. We just asked them to go into further detail about some of the things that they were saying. And so we have all these and we get a lot of our research team is two undergraduates led by myself and Dr. Rao. Um, to analyze the sentences that make up the essay. So if you've never done qualitative data analysis, you train, you can train people to look at certain sentences and then group them together. So student A says this and student B is saying the same exact thing and we can lump those together in a category. And our students, our research team came up with four predetermined categories that we were looking for in students' reflections. So the first one was about the infographic. So as Dr. Rat talked about, Service learning is made up of the actual experiential thing that students are doing. In this case, it was creating and disseminating an infographic, but it has to be tied to the content of the course. And in this case, this was the guest lectures and the lectures that Dr. Rapp herself gave. So we wanted to know, um, or we set those two categories up because those are sort of the defining features of service learning, the infographic in this case and the lectures. And then the, the prompt also asked students to reflect on things that they had learned about COVID-19 so we created those categories in advance, one about just information that they learned about COVID-19 because it is a biology class and that was a lot of the content they were getting. And then a fourth category for anything else they talked about related to COVID-19. And so with that, um, what part of our module um, do you think that our students reflected on during these post-reflections? 
So do you think they talked more about the infographics? Do you think they talked more about the lectures? Do you think they just sort of like tried to verbalize all the information they learned? Or do you think that there was more that they were talking about that, that we couldn't predict um, at the front end? And so you can type your answers in the chat. Let's see if, if you thought what we thought. Yeah, so uh, getting a mix of them, but a lot of people thought that they would talk more about the infographic. I think we certainly going into this thought that students would be talking a lot about the service learning experience because it was so novel, right? This is the only science course that a lot of these, these students are taking and may take for the rest of their um, degrees as non-majors. Um, so they're getting this really cool like science integration with real world infographic and like real scientists coming in and, and talking with them about COVID. But in, in fact, we see, if you can go to the next slide, we see a spread of themes that we fit into each category. And we found that the most that students were talking about was COVID-19 information itself. So here we have a picture where we're showing all of the themes in a circular bar chart where we see service learning at the top, lectures to the right, COVID information at the bottom and to the left, um, all of the other themes we found related to COVID-19 in these post-reflection essays. If you go to the next slide and click one more time. So the first category was service learning infographics, which is a highlight of this curriculum. What we found was that students in their post-reflections expressed a lot of gratitude for being able to participate, that it was eye-opening. Um, it enabled them to actually use and search credible uh, sources, not just through the social media accounts and stuff that Dr. Rout was mentioning, but through credible sources like the CDC website, like actual research papers. Um, but, but sort of in, in the end, we don't really see students reflecting on these infographics, even though in our interviews, almost all of our interviewed students talked about them and said that they were helpful. There were no criticisms about the service learning infographic project. Um, there was just one note that students wish that they could also take a final to bump up their grade. But overall, we do see positive feedback related to the infographic assignment. However, we don't see students really ruminating on the fact that they had to do that. Um, if you go to the next slide. So uh, service learning lectures, the other pretty critical important part of this module, right, where we have all of these science experts, a COVID patient coming in and talking to students like firsthand about their experience. Um, we do see that students are reflecting on these lectures saying that they gave them a deeper understanding and um, they see that the virus needs to be taken seriously because of what these experts were saying and that some of them felt especially more informed about COVID-19 because of the lectures. And there are a few interview phrases that really stuck out to us. One student said, even if we had the module but didn't have the guest lectures, I don't think it would have been as effective as it was. And so we're thinking about service learning as both combining the experiential service, like the service thing they're doing, making the infographics, and the lectures, the actual teaching part. And it seems like the way that this, the service learning module was set up students are reflecting more about the fact that they had guest lectures. And that could be in part due to the fact that the infographic assignment was online um, because it was a virtual thing that they were doing. It might not have had as great of an effect as we have seen in previous semesters and in our previous research. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't dig too much into comparing uh, in-person to virtual service learning, but it did really stand out to us that, that all of the, the great things that students were saying, particularly about the lectures, that did inform their infographic assignment. If you go to the next slide and we, we see all the spread of information that students were saying specifically about COVID-19 that they learned in the context of the course. And so um, some of the highest themes were that students understood why they had to physically distance um, and they understood modes of transition um, transmission of the virus. Um, and a lot of these things were corroborated in the interviews. We had many interview, or I think it was half, so four out of eight of the interviewers um, talking about their knowledge and sort of getting excited about talking about all of the things they knew about COVID-19 and that it could spread via asymptomatic individuals. And even though I think from our perspective now, all of this is, is sort of common knowledge, but when we're thinking about March, April of the, of the year that the pandemic started, um, it was really surprising to us how, how quickly our students were able to, to grasp a lot of the concepts that the guest lecturers were, were talking to them about. And so it is good news that um, students got a lot of information about COVID-19. Something that was even cooler was that we didn't find any factually incorrect information, right? We're talking about the spread of, of misinformation online. 
and we didn't see any misconceptions that had been talked about in the literature um, by the time of, of this publication that indicated to us that our students were leaving the classroom with misconceptions, um, which is really good. Um, and could you go to the, the next slide? Okay, so the last um, category was sort of a lump all category for everything else they were talking about that didn't necessarily have to do with information or biology about COVID-19, that where students were reflecting on the pandemic, how it was affecting them or their families. Um, and uniquely, we see that, that a fourth of the interviewers mentioned how they were paying attention to how the pandemic exacerbated inequalities in healthcare, which is important to note because that was something that one of our guest lectures um, brought up in particular. So we do see that students aren't just leaving the, the class with factual knowledge that they can talk to their friends or families about like they had to do for the infographic assignment, but they're connecting it to, to the real world situation that was going on at the time. And, and so we see in the next slide, the, the big picture here is that our post reflections revealed um, that students had a lot of learning, factual correct learning about COVID-19 as a result of this class. But when we go back to our research question, which parts of our modules did students reflect on uh, during the assignment? We see our main findings were that students referenced the guest lectures more than they referenced the service learning assignment itself, but overall reported learning correct information and practices related to COVID-19. And this is really exciting for us because there isn't a lot of work on service learning using guest lectures. And so as Dr. Rout's classes has, have continued over the subsequent semesters, um, she's been able to integrate more guest lectures and sort of assess the, the degree to which that does help students compared to just their professor, um, which is really exciting. It's an avenue of service learning um, research. I mean, service learning is, is already pretty under-researched in, in non-majors classrooms. And there's a great need for that, but tying this together with expert voices seems to be really important for students. And so um, with that, I would like to thank all of the, the amazing guest speakers that visited the class, the Director of Office, the Office of Service Learning and Undergraduate Research at UAB, and many undergraduate research um, without whom this work would not be possible. Thank you so much. Well, at this point, um, we'll start to take some questions and engage our speakers in a Q&A. So I have a question to get us started while our audience is thinking of their questions. And when you do have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box, which can be found in your Zoom toolbar on the bottom. And if you wanna ask your question anonymously, you can do so by sending me, Rachel, a message um, directly in the chat. Okay. So um, my first question to get us started, um, and this could be for either one of you, can you talk a little bit about what brought you to um, publish scholarship in teaching and take a more scholarly um, approach toward your teaching and thinking about how do I improve my teaching? How am I going to help my students learn a little bit better by using the scientific process and vision and change? Yeah, I, I really started to think about what I was teaching and also like assessing after I started going to the Society for Society of Advancement for Biology Education, also known as SABER, in 2014. It got me thinking. Uh, it was one of the hardest things to come up with a question and then um, find people to talk to. I started reading more and I felt like, you know, I, I am doing novel things and I should write this up so that I can share my findings with others in the field who would like to do something innovative of this nature. So that, that was the driving force after reading Vision and Change. I think for me, I grew pretty weary as a student in, in more traditional classes, sort of coming from a low income first generation background, I, I realized sort of the, the odds are stacked against certain students. Um, and it's much worse for, for other students. And I, I think that was really what drove me to want to help change classroom practices. Um, and I think so a book that, that really changed how I think about transforming these, these passions and desires into scholarship was, was the book Scientific Teaching um, by Dr. Joe Handelsman, and I'm forgetting the other authors. Uh, how, oh man, okay. Um, <laughs> by Dr. Joe Handelsman and colleagues, um, which really lays out not only how to do active learning um, and what instructors can be doing for their students, but how to assess it for the student's gain. Um, so I, I highly recommend the book Scientific Teaching. 
That was an outstanding book. I I really recommend that as well if you haven't gotten into it yet. And um, how did so you said you went to Saber? Um, how did you um, gain the skills that you needed in quantitative and qualitative methods in order to do this type of research? That's a great question. We started reading a lot of papers. We started talking out to folks in the field. We started reaching out to them as to how we do this. Um, I also remember enrolling myself in ASMQ's biology education online course series. I think it's going to be offered again next fall. So I enrolled myself in that because it was too late to be a part of ASM Scholars Program. It had already paused. And after reading papers, talking to collaborators, uh, and people are always eager to share what they know with others. So uh, I think that all drove me. And of course, finding colleagues in my own department. And then of course, we have grad students like Sarah, and then we recruited a big army of undergrads who started working with us out of nowhere. So that's how we came this far where we are today. I tend to ask this question at every webinar and the thing that comes out in almost everybody's answer is um, networking and building a community and learning from others that have gone before me. Um, so. Thanks for sharing. And I was wondering, um, you mentioned this for a non-majors course, but on your horizon, or maybe you're doing it right now, what other kinds of courses would be great targets for um, an e-service learning module, in your opinion? I think you can implement service learning in chemistry. You can implement service learning in physics. You can also do it in like majors biology. Um, you can almost creatively start thinking where the gaps are in the student's understanding and then think about like what's out there in your community that the students can learn from, although it's bending a little backward um, and thinking using the backward design and like thinking about what do you really want the students to gain out of all of this? Where is it? that they usually fumble. So those are some of the areas I would look into. I also have to admit that we have a very robust service learning office on our campus. That's a huge champion of these, of these endeavors. And that's why it was so easy for us to implement service learning. So if you have an office on your campus, you may wanna do that. Um, I will be more than happy to share many more thoughts on what anybody, if anybody else is interested in doing. Uh, service learning routinely has been used for 20, between 20 to 25 students. A lot of people are using course-based undergraduate research uh, in the context of cures, uh, but that's, that's again a very small student population. What we did for the first time felt like daredevil. We had like more than 100 students in our class to take 100 students out into with five different community partners. We had to keep the process extremely well organized and it happened at the class time. So the students were not devoting any additional time like the way normally they do in many of the non-STEM courses. But now since we have figured out a way to do it really right, I think it could be done in almost every class. And the students do say in evaluations, also on our interviews, how much they have enjoyed um, working along with their classmates um, in these novel endeavors because there are societal issues, climate change being one of them, evolution is another one, uh, plastic pollution, we did that. Um, we are currently exploring opioid addiction in a 100% online class with 250 students. So that's pretty record-breaking as well. Um, and it's going well so far. Um, and so it, it could be done, I think. It sounds like you're saying that um, pick any issue that's affecting our greater society at large and find out, you know, where could you bring that issue in? And, may, and maybe um, if it was me teaching, I might try, I mean, climate change is near and dear to my heart because I'm an oceanographer. So um, I might pick that, but would you suggest to pick a topic that's near and dear to your heart and really important to you as an instructor? Uh, yeah, sure. What I did was, uh 
talk about plastic pollution because people invariably fail to realize how plastics are made, that it's actually oil, that fossil fuel that has to be utilized to mold any plastic, you know, fumes exuded and how it's tied with climate change. So that was the first time I implemented service learning along with that. Um, and it worked really well. We have a paper that's published in Sensor 2020 uh, that talks about how we implemented that. We have another paper coming, which is a curriculum piece describing how to actually accomplish service learning in a, in a STEM class. So that should lay down the blueprint for many other instructors that if I could do it, yes, you can do it too. Would that be in Jimby or another um, journey? <laughs> um, that, that, <laughs> that is- Oh, okay, it has a bit, it's not impressed. All right, I'll- <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Quiet for now. Um, one question from the audience, and this could be either one of you. Were the infographics made by individual students or by group of students? And if you were to do it again, would you change that method of individual or by groups? We did it in groups uh, because it was a large class. If the class size is between 30, 40, 50, I think I would have given this assignment one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, majority of our non-majors are also like older students who work longer hours. So I had to be cognizant of that fact. And in order to make sure that the group activity was going to be successful, we also have a group assessment rubric that is a published item survey that we use. And depending, so they are supposed to rate themselves and then they're uh, group mates. And depending upon the rating, uh, we also tell them that that will play a role in how we determine their grade uh, for the activity so that nobody free rides. But uh, we did that in groups. Sarah, do you think, would you recommend that if you were to do it in future, would you use groups again or would you ask students to do it individually? Or does it even matter, do you think? I Go ahead. Yes, Sarah, go ahead. I was just going to say there's probably like maximal student gain in terms of having autonomy over the product if it's individual. But I, I think that the limitation here is the manpower needed to grade and help students. Right. And so that's where the peer leaders come in. Um, and I think with without that, without the TAs or the upperclassmen students trying to, you know, grade 250 infographics just is strategically hard for the professor. So, so I think in, in addition to having teams of students work together and sort of help with those communication skills. Um, it's just strategically easier, I think, to, to have people work together to make them. Um. Yeah, I would like to add that, you know, when you bring students from different majors and class levels together, it really brings diversity to the table. So everybody comes in contributing something really unique. I mean, some of, in our previous assignment related to opioid addiction, I was incredibly proud of my students for the brochures that they created to raise awareness for opioid addiction, which is pretty rampant in Birmingham area, and especially more so in the pandemic. Um, it was really touching to see. It almost looked like somebody had printed the brochure. It looked like an expert had made it. It was so good. And that's because when an arts major, a marketing major, and a and a public health major come together, you know, wonders could happen. So I think it's fostering diversity by bringing them in groups. Stay on this topic a little bit, because um, the person from my audience had the same follow-up question that I was going to ask. When, when you do them in groups, which I completely understand because um, you just can't grade 250 outcomes, right? And, and they learn, and you, um, they learn how to work together as a team. And do you have those students self-select their groups or are they assigned? And a next part of that question is, what about um, how would you maybe change up groups and group selection depending on the modality of the class? Is it whether it's face-to-face -face or online? Would that group selection change based on how you teach? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a fantastic question. So I have done pre-assigned groups, both in an online class and also in a face-to-face -face class. And what we do is like towards the beginning of the semester, after the ad drop date, 
We divide the whole class in groups and we do that. Because if you let them self-select, there are a few students, maybe they're absent that day. So it's it's more of a hassle with when you have a class of 200 to find them group mates. So it becomes extremely easy. What we do is like on Canvas, after the ad drop date, we divide them through a cat me program that my TA knows really well, more than me, I think. We put in the queries for the class level and all of that. And then we also have a DEI uh, statement that when you are going to come in a group, you're supposed to be respectful of like other people's opinions and all of that. We've had those slight issues one time only. So now we, as soon as we talk about that and explain to them why it's important not to generalize and stereotype your thought process, um, I think that has that has worked really well. But we do the groupings right from day one. We tell them this is your group. You can study in your group because we have first two exams. So you, we usually don't front load a group activity. We want them to be acquainted with one another. So they do that for the first two exams. And instead of the final exam, we have a group project towards the end. And they are so, majority of them are very happy. There was just, I think one that Sarah described complained that there was no final exam. Majority of them are very happy. And I forgot to add that in the COVID-19, we had um, a very interactive lecture on microbiology talking about viruses, phages, and how the virus is transmitted and all of that, that was specially uh, designed by me. So I wouldn't let them self-select just to prevent like hassle at the end of an instructor as well. But if you have a small class, but then what happens is like, you like somebody in class, you know them, you tend to like, so you can have like same type of people coming together. You really want them to operate in a diverse group because when you graduate from, when they graduate from college and go to a workplace, it's not gonna look like people they like or people they know, or they're gonna look alike. You have to be exposed to diversity. So here is your chance to be acquainted with that. It's like at work, we can't always, we can't choose who we work side by side with. So you need to right. learn your skills in school. And I can see how that's really important, especially in a non-majors class where the students, you know, are likely don't know or are more likely to not know each other because they're coming in from different majors, right? Um, so I can see how that works really well. Yeah. Um, so I have, um, we're going to take a quick break from questions and we have some more questions to get to. And for right now, I'm going to launch a poll for our attendees. And if um, all of our attendees could please take a quick 30 seconds to give us a check on um, how you enjoyed this opportunity today. Um, Jim B Live is being provided free of charge to all members and non-members alike. Um, so please do give us your feedback so that we can continue running programs such as these in the future. And while you're thinking of that, I'll, um, put a link in the chat box. Um, there's always opportunities to volunteer with ASM. So into the chat box, I just put a website with all the current opportunities where um, uh, the leadership is looking for volunteers to get involved with ASM. Um, for instance, next week, we're doing a Wikipedia edit-a-thon and they're also looking for people to serve um, on the Council of Microbiology and chair elect. So you can look under um, opportunities to lead the society. So do take a look at that when you get some time. And if you are um, an educator, another opportunity um, will be the um, ASMQ. So into the chat with the URL there. And um, that meeting will be virtual um, July 13th to 15th, 2022. And that'll be your go-to meeting for all sorts of teaching strategies, um, thinking about things like how do I make my classroom more inclusive and equitable? Um, how can I teach certain labs? And proposals for abstracts will open up this month. So do take a look at that. Great. Thank you so much for providing your feedback. Now, um, one attendee had this question. I'm having difficulty thinking of topics that I could do for service learning. And so can you talk, a, do, would you be able to talk a little bit about um, for instructors that may not have a service learning office? Like, do you know of any communities or any good resources to help people get started? 
Sarah, you want to take that? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think this is with any classroom activity, like going back to your learning objectives. So Dr. Rout said the idea of backwards design, and if you're not familiar, that's where you basically decide what you want your students to learn. And you're like, I want students to be able to, you know, describe what global warming is or define this term. And then you decide what their activity is, or you, you decide what their assessment is, how you're going to assess that. And then you decide what their activity is. And so I think um, it's important to say like, if not just think about, oh, I want my students to engage in this activity, but I want to make sure through service learning that it actually corresponds with the content that you're trying to teach them. And I think from there, that could help you like really get into what opportunities exist out there, either in my state or in, or in my country to decide like, what are the organizations working with climate change that are virtual that I can attend to? And I think it would be hard for us to, to come up with all the possible, um, all the possibilities for what you could do. Um, but I, I think that's a good place to start. Like if you have a syllabus where you lay out your learning objectives, what is it you want students to learn? And then using those keywords, tap into sort of your local resources or national or virtual resources um, for opportunities that exist. And, and I think that the big thing is that you want not uh, you want to fill a community need. Um, and, and I think like even you're saying, you know, ASM has volunteer opportunities. And so are there are there even small things? I, I just like clicked on that link and I saw that you could write letters to legislatures about microbial sciences. So if you're a microbial professor, you could maybe just have your students write a letter. And I mean, they're serving a community need for ASM, which could correspond to a learning objective. And, and I think it's it can be as like granular as or as big as you really want it to be. Um, and, and I think a, another thing is that it might be hard to just look up like service learning you know, like internet searches for that, you really want to be looking at community needs in terms of the word volunteer, because that's the term that communities use to fill certain needs. Um, so I would just like look up volunteering in your, in your community or in your specialty or whatever, and figure out what needs already exist that match up to the content you're trying to teach students. Thanks for the shout out for the Professional Society Service. Um, and you know, if you're not a member at ASM, um, I'm sure that other societies, um, other life science societies also have lots of opportunities for um, undergraduates and community college students and graduate students alike to get involved. Um, so do check your other professional society websites if that's applicable to you. And so um, going forward, you, um, you know, you've been online and you um, published this great paper about a virtual opportunity. But going forward, um, do you think that um, in-person opportunities for service learning would be just as impactful? And what might be your recommendations for someone to get started with in-person service learning opportunities when that need presents itself again? Yeah, sure. Um, if you don't have an Office of Service Learning, I would encourage uh, um, instructors to go and talk to student affairs because these are the two arms of the university student affairs and academic affairs that a faculty member never encounters and they have deep contacts into the community. So they may be able to like find places for your students to work with volunteer and like help accomplish the service learning activity. Uh, very recently, we, um, we did the opioid addiction module and again, we did, not, we did not have a service learning partner at that point in time. So what we did was we asked the students to build flyers and then they were around the exact same class time after building the flyers, the brochures, they were asked to like explain about opioid addiction to college students at the union and at other places where students normally gather by the cafeteria and just explaining things to like other students. It, it helped them to reinforce like what they were learning in the classroom about uh, these cutting edge issues. Another way we, we have another upcoming paper that's on podcast. So we asked the students to get into groups and create a podcast. And we propagated these podcasts again through our course Instagram pages. And the students were so proud of what they had created uh, because they were, these were like professional quality podcasts. We gave them equipment, we gave them training, and it was nice and easy. It was very inexpensive. And that is another way you can, you can, you can do that face-to-face, -face, um, like asking them to do it. I also think all in all, service learning works really, really well for in-person classes. After doing it online, I don't know if the students are exhausted right now because of the pandemic, 
um, it was a little hard to keep them motivated. And also you don't see the instructor or your group mates. It was like meeting on Zoom. That's what I used to do. Yeah, it's, it seems like from the student perspective, anytime your teacher tells you to do something, like it's an assignment, it's just a task to do. And I think in person, it's like, oh, this is engagement, like we're actually helping people. So I think something that could help, I know this doesn't directly answer your question, but if if you have an online class to add the human element, I think having the, the COVID survivor in this case was, was a human element to why they were actually creating the things that they were creating. And something else I think is really cool about Dr. Rout's research and, and sort of this whole research goal is redefining sort of using the, the needs of your university or of your students themselves to be the community partner, right? We're not just thinking like, oh, traditional, like this is the volunteer opportunity in our community, we have to match with them. It's like, what are the needs right here around us in our college community? Um, and I think as we continue in service learning research, it would be exciting to compare student gains from all of these different types of um, actual projects they're doing. I think redefining who it is we're helping and why they're helping them is, is really exciting as we move forward in the service learning literature. Oh, there's your next project. I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> well, I wanna take the opportunity to thank you uh, as speakers. You all have been fabulous today and I've learned a lot myself. Um, and so um, with that, I'll wrap up Jimby Live and remind our audience that we can come back um, next Friday same time, you'll get another reminder email the day before. Um, and we're going to talk about the um, learning impacts on the microbiology for the health sciences concept inventory. We're going to have um, two authors of a recently published Jim B research paper. Okay, so thank you everybody for um, attending today, and we hope to see you next Friday. A recording of this will be posted to Jim B's YouTube playlist, and you'll get a link to that. Um, probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Speakers, I appreciate it.